Just a question to really think about as we dig into what may be considered the linchpin text of the entire book of James. One of the most famous statements in the book of James, which is faith without works is dead. Yeah, we're going to talk about that today. So the question to think about is, can a person profess faith and trust in Jesus as their Savior, publicly, audibly, verbally, and then live a life any way they choose? Somehow they've got the fire insurance because they've made the declaration. Can a person show no fruit in their life of a really transformed experience with Jesus and truly be a follower of God? Well, the text that we're going to look at today is at the core of really a broad teaching of the New Testament that answers that question resoundingly, no. And so we're going to dig it out for what it's meant to. We did warn you, James had a lot of those spiritual gut punches. This is a real big one. This is a gut punch with an uppercut coming at you today. Uh, but uh, the Holy Spirit is speaking through his inspired word. And so turn with me. It's page 855 in the Pew Bibles. We're going to try to dig into this because I'm sure as I say that, it raises all sorts of questions. And I hope to answer most of them today. And I hope to give that teaching context within the broader, clear teaching of Scripture that a person is saved by grace through faith alone in Jesus. Where does that question and answer and James's teaching here fit alongside that teaching? And so it's verse 14 of James 2. Um, and if you ha have a Bible at home, please open it up and follow along with me so that you can uh, see how we're bringing out the teaching here today. Beginning of verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food, and if one of you simply says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about those physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied, revealed by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good for you, even the demons believe that, and they shudder. You foolish person. I didn't say that. James said it just for the record here. <laughs> Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions worked together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, not just by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Now, I think that there would be a great tendency, and I've often heard this text preached in a way to explain it away, to soften its meaning. I want to start by being absolutely clear about what James is saying, because it is God's word. I'm not trying to explain it away. I want you to embrace it. But I do believe before we're done, you're going to understand that James is not teaching a different gospel. 
James is not saying something contrary to the Apostle Paul, who says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that anyone should boast. We often forget that Paul goes on and in the next verse says, but we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, created for good works that God ordained in advance for us to do. Scripture throughout connects how we live with the validation of our faith. James just puts it right up there as, in as strong a word as he possibly can. And James is clear enough to say that if your life doesn't demonstrate that you're, you have been changed, if your life doesn't manifest transformation that is lived out, then that faith that you think you have probably isn't there. So what he's trying to help us understand is that this is a, a matter of eternal life and death. And so let's look at it. And we're going to start by trying to lay clearly what he says. And I, I've broken it down this way. There are three truths about faith and action. And then there are three clarifications about faith. And then there are three illustrations about faith and action. And you're counting those. And if you put minutes to them, you'll know we'll be here all day. So I promise you I'm going to... I'm going to roll through those quickly. And then I've done some whiteboarding for you that I think will help lay this whole thing in the context of the fact that clearly we are saved by grace. But here's the thing. Faith works. And it's observable. And those works, if faith exists, are not required, but they are inevitable in the life of the believer. So let's start and look at exactly what he's saying. And so the first way I would put it is these three truths about faith in action are that one fruit in our lives is necessary proof of faith in our hearts. Verse 14, what good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them. Is that the type of faith that is truly a saving, transformational faith? Fruit in our lives is necessary proof of faith in our hearts. That's why in verse 18 he says, I'm going to show you my faith by how I live. Now remember we said that James, who is the brother of Jesus, is really repeating and is clearly influenced by Jesus' own teaching. So if you think James is sort of an outlier in talking about this, you're really missing the whole of Scripture, but in particular Jesus' teaching. Let me, for instance, read for you in Matthew 7 when Jesus said, By their fruit you will recognize them. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. He goes on, and he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, this is startling. It's not going to be up there on the screen. This is startling when Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. And then he doubles down. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Drive out demons, perform miracles all in your name. And Jesus said, and then I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who are an evil doer. That's startling. It brings up this question then, if miracles, if prophecies, if demonic warfare are not evidence of genuine faith, if those aren't the deeds by which we are known, then what is? And that also raises the notion that there are all sorts of people gaining a whole lot of spiritual influence because they claim to be prophets, because they claim to do spiritual warfare, because they claim to do miracles, and Jesus is going to say to those people 
who some of you watch on TV and say, that's a person of God. I never knew you. Because those things are not the works, the fruits of faith that Jesus and James are talking about. So what are they? Well, he goes on. And the second thing he says is that how we treat the poor and oppressed in particular proves the presence of faith in our life. And James isn't alone in this either, right? But he says, suppose a brother or sister comes to you and they are without clothing, and you simply say, and let me paraphrase, when you say, go in peace, be warm, be filled, that's the classic, I'm going to pray for you, brother. You just wish them well and say, hey, I'm going to pray for you about that need. But you have the wherewithal to help, and you don't. What good is that? Now, this is just one of many passages in the Bible that connect our treatment of the poor and the oppressed to our faith, right? John says it in 1 John 3, 17, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? John is challenging the genuineness of a person's love for God, therefore they're standing with God by how they treat the poor around them. Now in those cases, obviously, it's speaking about brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, how we treat one another. But Jesus will go farther than that. And before I read Jesus' teachings on this, let me give you the third thing that I think James is saying quite clearly, and it's blunt. And that is people who fail to help the poor and the oppressed are in fact not saved. That's startling. I I wish I could say it didn't say that, but it does. It says how you treat those who God cares about. It's in God's nature to care for the, the, the poor and the oppressed and the needy. Our call to justice as people isn't a secular device. It grows directly out of the character of God and his care for people. And so therefore, if our lives are being transformed, we will care for those that God cares for, that Jesus speaks of. And so I'm going to go to, very quickly, one of Jesus' most famous parables where he talks about the judgment day and the separation of those that are his true children, which he calls his sheep, and those that are the counterfeits, close but no cigar, no, close but no Holy Spirit. There you go. The sheep versus the goats. I'm going to read, you listen along, and then at some point the text will keep catch up with me. Jesus' own words, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right, the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, the sheep, the true people of his flock, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Why? Because of words of prophecy? Because of miracles? Because of demon warfare? No. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison, you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or in needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? See, I, I want to be clear here. We have the benefit of seeing this text and knowing that when we go out and minister to these people, we're ministering to Jesus. But the first people who heard this didn't even know it was Jesus they were caring for. They said, when did we do these things and do it for you? Their natural heart was turned towards those people because their shepherd's heart turns towards those people. And so they're shocked to find out that Jesus said, when you did that, you were doing it to me. 
Verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. There's a whole bunch of people in the people of God that Jesus is now separating out as those who are truly his sheep and those who are goats, they are, are semi-lookalikes. And these people have found a way to justify and explain away caring for the needy, maybe because they find them undeserving and because they argue with the political realities of it. Or they call it something else, like social justice, which somehow is now seen as a secular concept, when in fact... All justice is social. The term justice and righteousness, righteous is a religious, it's a relational term. It means right relationship. And so the fact is the world may have stolen the concept, but it grows right out of the heart of God. And Christians are the ones that should own that idea. But here's a whole group of people that have found a a way to pursue their faith, to think everything's fine, And they've justified a life apart from the very thing that God says will mark a genuine follower. When was, when were you hungry, Lord? Or a stranger, or thirsty, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and we didn't help you? When did that happen? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. These are hard words. They are. We're going to put them in context for you. But I want to start by helping us take another step at James' teaching and look at three clarifications he makes about true faith. We've looked at James' very harsh teaching about the connection of faith and action. Now I want to look at three qualifications about true faith itself. And the first, two of them are found in in verse 19. And the first, first is that true faith is not just acknowledging spiritual truth. When he says in verse 19, you believe that there is one God, he's referring to the Shema, right? The, the Lord our God, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and you will, love your neighbor, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Remember, he's writing to Hebrew Christians who are scattered all over. He's referring to the ancient creed of the Hebrew people. So what he's saying is, you say, I believe the right thing. I I claim this as spiritual truth. And he reminds us that even the spiritual enemies of God know that to be true. So faith, true faith, is not just acknowledging what is true spiritually. The second thing in the same verse is that faith is not just the emotional response that we all hunger for to say, yeah, this is faith. It's not just an emotional response. Even the demons have an emotional response to that truth, they shudder at it, right? And very often we confuse the presence of genuine faith with an emotional experience as though that alone is proof of faith. And James doesn't let us get away with that, right? Recently, there has been another deconversion of a well-known spiritual influencer. His name is Joseph Solomon. And for a number of years, he has many tens of thousands of followers. He has put out beautiful poetry and expressions of faith. And he just recently came out and said, I am no longer a Christian. And in a podcast where he talked about it, he's broken and I have great sympathy for him. But what he says is, hey everyone, I tried really hard to experience God and I have never experienced him. I think that speaks to one of the problems with American spirituality, maybe global spirituality today. We think genuine faith is rooted in our individualistic experience of God. 
We're looking for an emotional response as though where God will show up is in our own private little space and we have our own private little Jesus. And this individuality of our experience is a decidedly unbiblical notion, even though it's an American notion. And, and what I think has happened with so many of these people who have looked for that experience and made these professions and tried to convince themselves is that they, the reason why they haven't experienced Christ in their life is because Christ is out in the highways and byways with the needy. He's out there with those who his heart is called to, and he wants us to be out there. And I've never found a person, look at Mother Teresa, I've never found a person who's devoted their life to ministering to people in Jesus' name that has not said, I have found and experienced and seen Jesus. Because he said, when you do it to the least of these, you've done it to me. We're looking for experience. We're looking for reasoning. God wants us to live it out. And that brings the third thing about true faith. Faith involves willful obedience. Now, it's really important that you understand that that doesn't mean that the obedience earns us anything. But when I put my faith and trust in Christ, it means I'm, I'm committing myself to follow Christ. I'm committing myself to walk in his ways. It is not just acknowledging the gospel is true. It is being transformed by it that represents and makes my faith known, validates my faith. In other words, you reveal your faith not just by what you think or how you feel, but in what you do. Godly deeds will always follow genuine faith. Does that make sense? Now, he uses three illustrations of faith, and we won't take time today to go into all of them because I want to get into a little, uh, I, did, I spent a lot of time on this diagram I want to spend just a few minutes with you. Uh, but let's just talk about those three things. Maybe you could follow up and study them as a follow-up devotional. But basically, the three illustrations are a sibling, a saint, and a sinner. <laughs> the sibling is when he says, suppose one of you, spiritual brothers and sisters, sees a need and just well wishes or prays for the person. That's the first illustration, which we've already went through. But then he uses a great saint of the Hebrew people, Abraham, who was also used by uh, the Pauline theology that has strongly influenced the book of Hebrews in Hebrews 11, whether or not Paul wrote it or not. Clearly, it's Pauline in nature. Paul uses the same illustration of of Abraham's life to say, here's a life lived by faith. Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as to righteousness. James says the same thing, and he says, like what Paul is saying, or the Pauline theology of Hebrews, and like the Old Testament, it was demonstrated when he laid Isaac, when he offered Isaac up. That's how his faith was revealed. Even God the Father says, now I know that you love me more than your son. And then he talks about the sinner, Rahab, who uh, demonstrated her faith and trust in God when she acted on behalf of the spies. And all he's simply saying is that the reason why we're confident of their faith is because of how they lived, how it was demonstrated. Now, I want to be very clear about this. Where does James' teaching fit contextually in the broad idea of the gospel, and in particularly when set alongside Paul's teaching about salvation by grace alone through faith. I was spending some time trying to help us understand this because I think sometimes people think James and Paul are having a theological debate with each other. Is it grace alone through faith or is it works too? And I think we're misunderstanding the broader context. And so um, I really love in meetings and in, in, you know, smaller groups to whiteboard. And I wish I could whiteboard. So instead, I, I created a virtual whiteboard for you that I think will lay this out and help you understand James' context. So I'm just going to go through it just as quickly as I can. If you're interested in the finished product when I show it to you, 
Uh, we're going to basically virtually draw this thing I put together this week to lay it all out, all right? So first diagram. The central idea of, of the gospel, the central idea of scripture is Jesus, the cross, and redemption. And that all of that comes by grace through faith alone and that that salvation is God's gift. So let's be clear. The Bible resoundingly teaches this as the core of the gospel message. Now, Paul is writing primarily to, as a pastor, but when he writes, he's writing against one of the early uh, distractions of the gospel, one of the early heresies, and that was works-based salvation. They were known as the Judaizers. You've heard us talk about them a lot, right? And what the Judaizers were coming in is they were threatening the gospel by saying it's not just by grace alone, it is by works. You, not only any work, but you have to come under the Hebrew law, the Levitical law right? You have to follow all of these things. It's grace plus works for salvation. That's religiousness, right? And that's what Paul is writing against. That is what we mean by Pauline theology. Paul is writing primarily to correct that heresy. He wants to push believers back, and that's the next arrow, Thank you. He wants to push people back to the truth of salvation by grace alone. And what he calls that works-based salvation is a false gospel. It's a false gospel. It leads to religious legalism. I can earn right standing with God by how I live. And because it's a false gospel, the end of it is death, right? So Paul is teaching with a decided bias to correct those in the churches he has started who have been persuaded that they need to work their way, not just trust in God's finished work. But there is another threat to the beauty of gospel by grace. It's not works-based salvation. It's easy believism. It's cheap grace. It's the message that says, well, if I can't work my way, then I can just trust in Jesus, and if I got that covered, then I can live my life any way I please. No change is necessary. And what that leads to is, I think, what largely has invaded the church today and our society, that people claim to be Jesus, Jesus followers because they've made some literal confession, some acknowledgement of truth, but there is no change whatsoever in how they live. And they think they're okay because they got baptized and they made a profession. That's cheap grace. That is what James is preaching against. You see, in their way, both of these great men of God are protecting the true gospel. You see, James calls that, or ultimately he says, that produces license. License says, I can live my life any way I want. And that's why, whereas Paul calls works-based righteousness a false gospel, James calls cheap grace a false faith. Do you see it? You following it? And that's why it fits in. And it's just as dangerous because it is a false faith. It also leads to to death. So both of these men are not competing against each other. They're fighting separate battles against the true gospel. Paul is saying, don't get caught believing that you can earn a right standing with God. You can't. Jesus died because you couldn't earn that. James is saying, don't let that turn into the notion that your life isn't meant to be transformed and demonstrate true faith in your life. That's cheap grace. You're making a mockery of the cross. That's false faith. Does that make sense to you as you look at that now? And so what we come back to is the purity of this message by grace through faith alone. That is the true gospel. And what that leads to, according to scripture, is a changed life. We call that sanctification. 
And so whereas the salvation is by grace through faith in Christ, the byproduct of that salvation is a transformed life that is demonstrated by the fruit that we bear, which significantly is demonstrated by how we treat the neediest among us. It's an inescapable truth in Scripture. And it's worth our looking at. And that is the path to life, to eternal life, right? So show the whole chart. That's what it would look like if I whiteboarded it for you. And if you're interested in getting that, just put it in the text or let me know and I'll be happy to send you that PDF. I think that helps put all this into place, right? We don't earn salvation. We are all sinners saved by grace, but salvation changes us. Faith works. And that's why the the final statement for you to understand today is that works, deeds, acts of mercy and justice aren't so much a requirement of Christians as an inevitability of genuine faith. And we have every right In fact, we have a responsibility if we don't see that transformation in people to call them to true faith because it's about eternal life and death, right? A transformed life particularly demonstrated by reflecting God's concern for justice and mercy is an inevitable result of genuine faith and is therefore the fruit by which we are to be known.